Hi, everyone. Um, the other day, I asked somebody, would I have to hug everybody? <laughs> and it turned out to be a lot more fun <laughs> than I thought it might be. So if I didn't get to you yet, don't leave before we get a hug. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, I'm not really speaking right now. <laughs> I just wanted to get your attention focused up here. And I just want to thank everybody. I know these are extremely busy times. Um, and I just want to thank everybody for, for coming here. And it's great to see you all. But you know, in the words of my niece's five-year-old son, this is crazy. <laughs> It's crazy why we're together. Um, you all know, so, and I can't even say it. Um, so, hang in there. There's a full program. It's all in front of you. And let's, uh, let's begin. Thanks, uh, Leslie, for bringing us all together here. I'm Esther Kaplan, and I first met Melanie at a Seder in the early 1990s at the home of Elisa Solomon and Marilyn Kleinberg Niemark, which I think was a plot to get Melanie to hire me at Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, which indeed she did. It was a fateful encounter 
Melanie went on to become a dear friend and a comrade in activist and writing and the Jewish mother that I never had. I wish the late great writers, Grace Paley, Adrian Rich, and Gloria Anzaldúa were here to speak about Melanie in my stead. Melanie was dear to all of them, and Melanie carried so much of them with her. Grace's, I guess I should remind people to silence their phones. <laughs> Melanie carried so much of them with her. Grace's working class voice, Adrian's sure-footed exploration of eroticism and rage, Gloria's fascination with borderlands and border identities. Melanie contained multitudes. Above all, Melanie was authentic and Melanie was brave. She bared herself. Even when she felt deep shame, she had an unbelievable ability to sit with discomfort, with embarrassment, even with horror. I always saw a beautiful creative tension or complementarity in her relationship with Leslie. They both have rock solid ethics and spines of steel. But while Leslie's impulse and brilliant gift in the face of outrage is to swing into action and to mobilize the rest of us, Melanie had the gift of steadfastly facing the horror allowing us to sit with it, to absorb it, to truly feel it, to go to the depths. It's easy to get hardened after a while. She opened up space for us to be newly appalled by the ongoing degradations and brutality faced by the people of Gaza or the life-constraining terror of sexual violence and police violence. Melanie's poems and her speeches, often written in the midst of crisis, made it all land again with a thud right in the chest. I would say she kept the soul of the movement present for all of us. Her authenticity, think of her name, Melanie K. Kantrowitz. She was raised Melanie K, but when she decided to reclaim the Jewish Kantrowitz, she refused to shed that assimilationist history. The slash between Kay and Kantrowitz, a line, a border between two ways of being, two kinds of Jewish identity, whose inheritance, for better and for worse, were hers. Unlike many people, I met Melanie first and then encountered her writings. I was a youngster helping out in the J Fridge office and we spent a lot of time together. We'd work hard and forget to eat till we were starving, so we'd dash out for food and then she'd sit and experience such unadulterated pleasure in these mediocre salad bar roasted potatoes. <laughs> this intense presence of hers and her ability to be in the moment, this was also part of her authenticity. Her bravery. There's a long overdue conversation happening now about white fragility, the way white people's discomfort about acknowledging white privilege shuts down not only conversations, but social progress. Melanie was the opposite, brave as hell. Like almost no one else I've ever known, she could face down the terrible implications of being white in America unflinchingly, unflinchingly. A few of you will remember the 1990s controversy surrounding the claim by a City College professor, Leonard Jeffries, then chair of African American Studies, that Jews had financed the slave trade. You can imagine the backlash from the organized Jewish community. Melanie's response was to plan a J. Fridge Forum to explore the history of Jewish involvement in slavery, to confront it. And when one participant asked in anger, why no one had ever apologized for Jewish involvement in that wretched catastrophe, Melanie had the presence to simply do so. She didn't waste energy explaining that her family was still back in Europe at the time. She just shouldered the collective responsibility and spoke immediately, instinctively, 
She moved the dialogue forward fearlessly. She never shut it down. She talked about bringing the past into the present. Melanie embraced her working class identity, but also wrote about the experience of shame that capitalism imposes on poverty. She'd been an early organizer against domestic violence, and yet she had the guts to write openly and searingly about ending up in a violent relationship herself and how she stayed in that violent relationship for years. She leaned into shame. She let it teach her. She interrogated her own experiences, her own complicity, with deep humanity, but without mercy. Her extraordinary ability to mentor young writers and activists, I was one, stemmed from this bravery too. She was never threatened by generational change, by shifting social justice frameworks and priorities. She loved new language, new identities. She was curious. She believed people from different generations and ideological frameworks had enormous amounts to teach each other. She was intellectually alive and nimble. She was also alive to people's personal and political contradictions and deeply generous about the potential for solidarity whenever or wherever it was possible. She asked in the issue is power, how to remain human in the face of violence and victimization, answering that it means not only feeling deeply, but acting morally. She modeled both. Good afternoon. I'm June Cumberbatch. I'm a former student and colleague of Melanie's. We, I went to school and we worked together at the Queens College Extension Center. <laughs> and in the Urban Studies program. I would like to say that Melanie has been a mentor and a friend through all my college days and long after, even into her death. She allowed me to look at others and to look at the aspect of life in every thought, action, and feeling. And she forced you to look at issues that made you thoughtful, representative, and respectful of other persons, and allowed you to respect their differences and be accepting everyone for who they are and where you meet them. She will always be in my heart, and I am very proud to call myself a friend. Thank you. Hello. I'm Ronnie, Melanie's sister. And she was my witness through my whole life, and I was hers. Um, I wrote this to her, though I could never say it to her, before she died. Uh, but before I say that, I want to say, Leslie, I'm so grateful to you. She got such care, and she said, Leslie, always rescued me. And to Christine, if Christine is here, I'm very grateful to her. And as Melanie was dying, Christine was stroking her fingers and humming to her. OK, here's what I wrote. Melanie, I know you can't speak beyond yes, no, not really. And I know you have thoughts and can't quite coordinate them with your mouth to speak. And I know you must feel strange in one way or another. And I am not, of course, sure of how all that settles down or if it does. 
and I can't even believe what is happening, though I am trying to accept more of what is happening, which makes me feel terrible. How can I accept the total loss of your agency and that you may not be here for much longer? Even as I say that, to write it is too terrible. I miss your beautiful smile, your so expressive eyes, your amazingly wry and hilarious sense of humor, your love, the fun we had. I miss all the things we shared so much, so much trust our whole childhoods, even as they were different, me inside the fishbowl, you outside, either devastating. I still remember a couple of wonderful things. You sneaking into the bathroom in the hospital where I had just given birth so you could stay longer than the visiting hours and how you told me after a bad breakup, you'll never feel this bad again. And I didn't until now. And this is just to demonstrate her brilliance. This is a, a, maybe the last poem that Melanie ever published or maybe wrote, hi Amy, called P.D. And the, and the B-Side, P.D. and the B-Side. This is by Melanie. This is her courage. In the music industry, the B-side is the filler, the side that exists to fill out the A-side, make it whole. For me, it has come to represent what might happen. The A-side is normal, a fairly low-risk life, but bonded always to the B-side, waiting to happen. On the A-side, for example, I cross the street. But on the B side, I walk in front of a speeding car. Maybe if I'm alert, I can elude the B side, but it is waiting. And PD is Parkinson's disease. I have PD. The B side is PD waiting to happen. When I'm walking out Ruby the dog, the B-side slivers in close with its snake breath, and as I walk toward the 94th Street Bridge, kind of isolated now that I think of it, I can smell the B-side. In this case, two young men fixed on me and Ruby with violence in their hearts, if you can call those things hearts. But as fear swoons in my stomach, so I nearly pitch forward off the bridge. A new B-side rises up, a young man with punk hair. My father has Parkinson's, he says kindly. When were you diagnosed? But usually I turn up Corona, where A-side Ruby, the dog, pulls me off balance in her passion for breadcrumbs. Whereas B-side Ruby jerks so hard I fall, maybe even into the line of traffic, so hard her collar, which has prongs like you'd get for a Rottweiler, only Ruby weighs less than 35 pounds, she pulls so hard a prong punctures her carotid artery and sudden blood plashes, splashes brilliant against her black coat, an anarchist dog bleeding out. It might be falling down or even up stairs, stumbling across the table so everyone's drink spills. It might be crushing into my students' desks. It might be my bladder or sphincter loosens and shit or piss squeezes out. On the B-side, I am smelly and shamed. I drool, I twitch. On the A-side, my left hand flutters. My vision doubles, but my face is my own with its 17 muscles to mark my response, my history. 
On the B side, my face is a stone. I am locked inside my stone face. Or I am dangerous and endangered. On the A side, I drive with my left hand fluttering only a hit from time to time. And on the B side, I'm out of control. I drive into the path of a huge semi that crushes my car, leaving me miraculously alive, unhurt. Even though I just lied, I am not out of control. A truck hit me, and it had nothing to do with B-sides, or PD for that matter. The B-side casts a spell of explanation everywhere, pathologizing the A-side until it's hard to tell A from B. And isn't this the age of CDs anyway? No A, no B. B is for body. B is for branded. B for bloat. B for bleak. B for blood. B for brain. B for betray. B for break. B for blame. B for breathe, breathe, breathe. Hello everyone, I'm Helena Lipstadt. When Leslie asked me to say a few words here today, I told her I might just stand here and cry. She said, you won't be the only one. Leslie, I don't know if you know, but soon after you and Melanie got together, Melanie said to me on the phone in rather an awestruck tone of voice, Helena, it doesn't have to be hard. Relationships don't have to be hard. <laughs> and the two of you built the most loving, respect-filled, dynamically loyal life together. And you were that way together. If Melanie were here, I would tell her, Mel, I finally finished my book. Melanie was the first person to welcome my writing, to receive it gently, to say to me, more, I want to hear more. I wouldn't have come to this place of writing and finishing if not for her generosity. I never knew anyone who embodied generous and humble more than Mel. She was like my slightly older sister, who always had my back, her kindness coming to me through those green eyes. She set for me a great example of honesty and fearlessness in her work, affirmed my work, honored it as if it mattered, and made me understand it does matter. Melanie and I met in 1983 after the publication of the important book, Nice Jewish Girls, which she had contributed to, and I and my friends devoured. We met over anti-Semitism in rural Maine and gravitated towards each other, Jewish lesbians in the country. She was already a star in the firmament of lesbian writer activists. I was flattered by her attention a little in awe, but despite my awe, we became friends and built a traveling friendship. Maine, Vermont, Brooklyn, Philly, Queens. I'm remembering one Yom Kippur afternoon. We spent together outdoors with books in Fairmont Park in Philly. We came back to the house just before evening. The yard site candles we had lit earlier were still flickering in their cups. Hi, Milt, she said over the candle that she lit for her father, starting a tradition for us of talking to the presence of the glowing lights. A week after Melanie died, I received this email from Nava et Shalom, a wonderful poet and friend 
and a voice from the next generation. Nava says, I had a many hours Shabbos lunch this weekend with some of my dearest queer Jews, where we read Melanie's writing together and talked about what we'd all learned from her work and continued the big conversations we were always in the middle of about home and organizing and power and justice. I feel really lucky to have had Melanie as a lifelong influence on my imagination, even from afar. Melanie, I feel really lucky as well. Your brave voice, your tender, indomitable spirit shine on through us who love you, who you loved. I'm Sarah Gordon, and uh, this is a song that my mother, Adrienne Cooper, um, adapted and sang, and Melanie loved, and we're all going to sing it together. So there's a wordless part, a melody, and then there will be words, and I'll help you with those too. <laughs> Shouting peace, peace, peace. Voltech gehad koyech, voltech gehad koyech. 
wollt ich gelaufen in die Gassen, wollt ich gelaufen in die Gassen, wollt ich geschrieben schallem, wollt ich geschrieben schallem, oi schallem, 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 Hello, my name is Barbara Smith. I've been trying to remember when I met Melanie, and here's one way of figuring it out. I met her when her name was Melanie Kay. Uh, I met Melanie because of the women's movement, specifically that part of the women's movement where radical, anti-racist, lesbian feminists were doing revolutionary work in carving out a place to survive. A lot of us here know how tough it was to be out as a lesbian in the 1970s. There is an untold history of feminists who challenged white supremacy, who did anti-racist organizing, often in places where we were far from welcome. Our political activism and practice formed the roots of intersectionality before that word was invented. Melanie was at the forefront of this work, which is embodied in both her beautiful writing and activism. Her inclusive political vision was nowhere more clear than in her leadership of Jews for Racial and Economic Justice. Look at the name of that organization. It says, Jewish, Jewish people are challenging racism and class oppression. It says that non-Jews can too. People of color and Jews can work together. There are Jews who are people of color and people of color who are Jewish. Melanie was far more than an ally. She was an incomparable co-conspirator. I really need to say something about Leslie and to Leslie. How long ago or when did I meet Melanie? Well, one way of, again, marking it is that I met Melanie and Leslie before they knew each other. <laughs> it was called the 1970s. I, I certainly knew Leslie in the 1970s, and I'm pretty clear I knew Mel, uh, Melanie there uh, to our shared uh, interests as activists and as uh, writers. Um, there's so much history that is unknown and so much history that we share. There's so much um, integrity and courage that Melanie uh, embodies and always will. We need to share that uh, with those uh, who think that it may have been easy and who don't necessarily know uh, the uh, streets that we walked and the battles that we fought. Um, at the end of Sula, and this is for you, Leslie, and for all to whom it may be applied. At the end of Toni Morrison's Sula, Nell says, about Sula, and this is, as I said, the very last page of the novel uh, Sula. She says one of the most beautiful lines that I think uh, exists in literature, which is, and I say it to you now, 
We were girls together. Good afternoon. Oh, it's nice to see your faces. Uh, my name is Audrey M. My name is Audrey Sasson, and I am the current executive director of Jews for Racial and Economic Justice. I'm going to try to get it out so that <laughs> then I can talk. <clears throat> it is deeply humbling to be here today as we honor the life and legacy of the visionary transformational or oh, whew. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> I never got to meet Melanie personally, so I'm <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> As we honor the life and legacy of the visionary transformational organizer who made it possible for us to dream and imagine and actively build the world of tomorrow. I want to say a few words about who I am since I don't know many of you um, and as a way of telling the story of how in some ways I encountered Melanie without, without knowing her. I joined JFRIDGE as a member 10 years ago. I was a Mizrahi Jewish socialist from Montreal, Quebec, and I had never encountered anything like JFRIDGE where I spent my formative years. By the time I came across JFRIDGE, my life's journey could have been defined as two parts. The first, growing up feeling a deep connection with my Jewish identity, but in Ashkenazi dominant spaces where the narrative of my people, so to speak, was narrowed down to a single arc starting with our persecution in Europe and ending with the redemption, our redemption of, with the redemption of Israel's creation. I was being molded into what I call a Federation Jew, who would inevitably step into leadership and pass the narrative down to my 2.2 children in a staunchly Zionist household. <laughs> the second part was coming into my own as an organizer and activist on a range of issues having nothing to do with my Jewish story, or so I thought. I was organizing on campus against racism in our curriculum, pursuing a social work degree, and ultimately getting my feet wet in organizing for the rights of tenants, welfare recipients, and homebound seniors. There was no way to reconcile being a budding socialist of Middle Eastern origin with the stories I had been told about who I was and what I was expected to believe and fight for. So I went from assimilating into white Ashkenazi and Zionist spaces to assimilating into activist spaces. I was becoming so disconnected from my Jewish identity, from my lineage, in fact, that I didn't know I missed it and craved it. Like many of you, I found in JFRIDGE a home where I could be my full self. I could be Jewish, I could be a socialist, I could be Mizrahi, I could organize on the issues that matter to me, like housing and worker justice and police accountability, in deep and trusted coalition with groups across the city. But mostly, I could be a radical Jewish left diasporist Grounding myself in doikite, a term I learned from Melanie's work, and Ottomanism, another one, um, as, as she so eloquently described in The Colors of Jews. Here was my lineage, and it was alive and well and breathing life into movements for justice across the city. Melanie, I so wish I could have met you in person and spent time with you and learned with you and struggled with complicated questions with you and been curious with you. I also deeply hope you somehow were able to see in those last hard years of your life how dynamic and exquisite and transformative the organization you birthed with Donna and Marilyn and Elisa and Esther and so many others in this room has become. Every day, new people join our ranks. For many of them, their stories are similar to my own and yet for everyone, their story is unique. As you so presciently wrote in The Colors of Jews, Diasporism means, given the multicultural nature of the Jewish community, inside the Jewish community, we should expect to experience the simultane simultaneity of home and strangeness. And, and you also wrote, diasporism recognizes our identity as simultaneously rock forged under centuries of pressure and water infinitely flexible. Diasporism requires those who know and value past and existing tradition 
and those who create new ones. I wish you could have joined us this year as we celebrated our first ever Juneteenth Seder. Led by black Jewish leaders, we gathered in our splendor and complexity as a multiracial, multi-ethnic, intergenerational, cross-class community and wove together like a braided challah, our multiple traditions and the creation of a new one. One that through storytelling and ritual and centering the margins as you, as you talked about, could truly imagine or at the very least catch a beautiful momentary glimpse of collective liberation and can strive towards it with a deep sense of purpose and in genuine solidarity with one another. I wish you could have been there in body, but I know without a doubt that you were with us in spirit, guiding us along the way and joining us in song. There's so much I want to share with you, Melanie, and with all of you here, to relay the depth and intensity of your impact and legacy. I want to tell you all about how our members launched the Jewish Vote this year, inserting a radical diasporic voice into local New York City elections, uh, and helping to shift <laughs> and helping to shift the balance of power in Albany. I want to tell you about our work in bringing a more robust, intersectional, and liberatory analysis of anti-Semitism to our movement partners on the left, and how immensely informed that work is by your teachings and all that you modeled in your extraordinary life. I could go on and on, but I know that many others are eager to share their tributes here today, and I'm eager to listen. So I will close by sharing a short note I sent to Donna, Marilyn, Elisa, and Esther after you passed. For what it's worth, I personally feel Melanie's impact every day at JFridge. It's everywhere, in the water, in the ethos, in the way we think and build and draw connections and imagine. Especially these days, with the rise of far-right nationalism, Melanie's gift of radical diasporism gets me up every morning and gives me strength to organize in opposition to the raging politic of division, exclusion, and fear, and for a world in which we choose solidarity as the highest expression of humanity. How blessed we are to have her vision guiding the way. Melanie K. Kantrowitz, Presente. Hi, I'm Amy Kesselman. Melanie and I became friends in <laughs> in Portland, uh, teaching in the Women's Studies program together. I, I left Portland before she got involved with the, um, anti, the movement against violence against women, into which she poured her uh, passion, her humor, and her creativity. But I have one little tidbit from that, which is this wonderful little sticker that Women pasted all over Portland, Oregon, particularly where they knew that women had been harassed or attacked. It's a drawing of the Red Queen from Alice in Wonderland saying, off with their rocks. <laughs> Disarm rapists. <laughs> In the women's studies program that I taught in, in, uh, at, in New Paltz, we had a tradition of reading poems to each graduating senior that we felt spoke to their spirit and their work in women's studies. I reached for this poem by Melanie many, many times because it is so powerful in explaining the kind of transformation that many of us went through in women's liberation and many people went through in the Women's Studies program. So I'm gonna read part of it. I have a few copies of the whole poem with me if anyone wants them. It was part of, I think, her first poetry collection by Melanie Kay in 1977 called Speaking in Code. And the title of the poem is Survival is an Act of Resistance. First, suffer. Second, repeat after me, it's my fault. Understand that you yourself have caused your pain, that, or that you are wicked and selfish for complaining about it. 
that this suffering is good for something. Heaven? Or character? Or just practice for what comes next? In and out of groups of women, nine women on the rug in a circle feel just as guilty as you do <laughs> for hating his sock smell, <laughs> for how he says the same thing every night. Coming to bed soon? It was not a question they noticed too. The door opens, walk through, walk through with a suitcase, toss a wake over money, the dark and the car, hole up for days in your bathrobe, hands tight in your pocket, fall through the black pit of your brain, touching for bottom. You your feet feel there's a floor to stand on. Check out the corners for pencils, dusty change. Fix your own toilet. Answer the phone. Discover that you like your face. Over coffee, your heart spills. Her eyes are full as yours are. You're scared. There were stories, you know and now they are coming true. And there's the last page. Here we are, sorry. Your brain opens, let it. Your body swims into reach, climb in. Learn, learn your body with caution. The black speckled notebook begins with a question. Who is the subject? Speak what you know. I am an edge to balance, one cell of the planet, also the planet's eye, also the woman who can learn to season and stir on one foot and dance. Sometimes the floor is not firm. Sometimes no one has stood on this ground before. That's it. My name is Judy. Is it okay? And I met I met uh, Melanie at uh, at a support group for Parkinson's and dancing for Parkinson's. And I can't quite tell you what drew us together, but probably her, her um, wry sense of humor was a contributing factor. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, she was so busy. I didn't know how busy she was until recently. She was writing papers, she was writing books, and she had very little time to add a friend, a full friend, I'd say. And she taught at Queens College. So she's, she's in my heart as a sweet person from the past. And hearing you all uh, tributes to her just confirms what I thought of her rather than knew. Um, I, I too have Parkinson's disease and uh, our support group 
was very, very helpful in forming a community and uh, a circle of friends. I think of it more as a circle of friends. And I, I can't uh, advertise for it, but I, I, I noticed that Melanie fix it on her list of contributions in her memory. Um, I think that's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you. So, our next uh, speaker, presenter, is not yet here, so I'm going to just go ahead. My name is Laura Meltzer, and I'm a student of Melanie's. I say student in the present tense because her guidance, her spirit, compassion, her sense of self and of the world is ever present. And I will never cease to be a student of these things. Audrey, I understand. <laughs> I was a part of the last class that Melanie taught at Queens College and had the privilege to work with her, reading and rereading an amazing manuscript. We sat together for many hours, days, months, even a year or two, reciting her words. Her writing embodies a truly powerful inner voice, one which reverberates from mind to paper to mouth. Along the way, she taught me things like the importance of laughing at yourself until you cried from hilarity. She enforced a joyousness, one which is in so much danger of becoming extinct. Becoming so well acquainted with Melanie's work helped me in finding my own voice. The woman in front of me, eyes bright, hair forever springing back into her face, emanated a force of radicalism onto its own. Melanie taught me what it means to write with a sense of self, and maybe in search of that. I would stick around after class, talking about the readings, and honestly, find a reason just to exist right there in her presence. She was the first and only one I confided in when one, of our one in our student activist group came out to me as an anti-Semite. In turn, she recommended that I meet more Jews. <laughs> Her life work proves that writing is not only for our bodies, for ourselves, but for others, with others. Those who move the world use their experiences as gifts. The good, the bad, anger, frustration, humiliation. It's what makes us human in a foreign world. Melanie had a gift of never letting that down. I miss her, but if I close my eyes ever so gently, I can see her study, the books which line the walls, and I'm taking it all in the authors and titles which informed her. And I'm realizing all along that she was the real deal, more powerful, more illustrative, certainly, than any book could be. And for that, I'm forever grateful. Thank you. <clears throat> so. Leslie asked me to uh, speak today about Melanie's earlier publishing days, and believe me, I'm honored to do so. I, my name is Joan Pink Foss. I co-founded Aunt Luke Books in 82, and worked with Melanie in the early 90s as her editor and eventually as her friend. Uh, and together we worked on My Jewish Face, and, uh, which came out in 1990, and then The Issue is Power, which came out in 1992. <clears throat> Melanie's final passing from our lives was too soon. It would always have been too soon. And in her last year, she had already moved away from many of our lives, or we from hers. But fortunate for us, writing and publishing were part of Melanie's life, so we now have a record we can look back on in order to consider those gifts she has left with us. 
In her short story collection, My Jewish Face, she has put us in close, considered contact with characters much like herself and characters much like the people she had met in her life. She draws thoughtful, humane portraits and carries us through the political 1980s as mostly seen by working class Jews, often raised in Flatbush. We follow characters who, as young women and sometimes older women, come into their own power and to their own understanding of what it is not only to be a feminist or a lesbian or a Jew, but to be a Jewish lesbian feminist during a time when coalition work demanded a clear understanding of one's own place in that work. This is a major gift, and it remains not only a historic record, but continues to speak to our contemporary political work. Her writing is truthful. So many of you know this, know her. Her writing is truthful at moments, even raw. As in her life, so in her writing, she is clear-eyed and constantly bringing an intelligent evaluation and location to those who are working for social justice. Of her fiction, she says, I found in fiction that I didn't have to be right, didn't have to have all the answers. Contempt dropped out and complexity dropped in. What she said she tried to do in the essays that comprise the issue's power is to try, where appropriate, to return to that inter interrogative mood that she had learned in fiction writing. And so she did. In this book, she writes that the three themes of power that circle these essays are the unbalanced power between men and women, power which is some and then sometimes gained as the partial result of violence as tool by oppressed people, and sometimes abuse of power of the state of Israel that can have the unfortunate result of scapegoating Jews as the cause of all power imbalance. But the essays go on to discuss activism, response and resistance, and the importance of coalition building by strong women of all marginalized groups giving advice on how to build those movements all the while discussing the complexities and the difficulties that arise in this construction. And also in these essays, she discusses the importance of writing at a time when women's work, women's work was just beginning to get rediscovered and newly published, though still not a part of the mainstream. How important it was for her and to the women around her, for instance, to have revealed histories of no women like Emily Dickinson, that, that they loved women. She asserts how important culture, especially literary culture, is in building movements and discuss carefully about the, the concept of who owned and who still owns the means to publishing. This is you know, something she would say is still important to consider today. And finally, in the introduction to the issues of power, Melanie wrote with prescience, and the stunning question, which encompasses all other question, is history of no use? And this question leads to the assertion, I write because I need history to be of some use. Many of you worked alongside, <clears throat> were friends with Melanie in the years since these books were published. But for so many of us who knew her mostly through her poems, stories, and essays, we are gifted by her writing, by her leaving us with a history that is of use by her living her life in a way that so benefited all of us in this room, as well, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as those who are not in this room and will continue to benefit those who may or may not even learn her name. But we here today attest to that important life and to its embodiment in that name, Melanie K. Kantowitz, Presente. I first met Mel uh, in the early days of Jayfridge, and um, but I had known her work, her writing, and her reputation for a long time, and was kind of in awe and amazed to find myself in a room with a, one of my a baby in, my, in a snuggly, uh, doing a workshop with the uh, leaders of this amazing new organization. I had known and worked with Leslie for quite a long time before that. So I don't remember what year it was, but 
a really important next part of the story was a letter that Leslie sent out, which she did now and then to many of her closest friends and relatives, saying that she had fallen in love with a poet. That was a great letter. <laughs> I was so happy. I loved Melanie's amazing wit. I loved her searing intelligence. I loved her scholarship. I loved that I learned every time I talked with her. And I loved how she loved Leslie. And how Leslie loved her, loves her. Some years back, I was at my desk and I got an email from Mel. You probably don't know this. And uh, she said, Kath, I have to talk to you. Let's get together and scheme about how we can help Leslie get a MacArthur. <laughs> Did somebody hear me? <laughs> so far, I wasn't that helpful, but I loved that she asked that. And we'll, we'll still ask that. Um, the Colors of Jews, I think, is one of the most important books about what it is about, which is everything, in some sense, in some fundamental sense. And, you know, some of us were very few in the old days uh, as Jews speaking on certain things. So I wanted to read this poem. When people say that Melanie is was and is brave. I was thinking as I was listening to these beautiful testimonials, I could never, she never swerved from something, we use the word truth, but Melanie always told the truth, and that is brave. Palestine in April 2003, Melanie K. Kantrowitz. Palestine. In April 2003, a hotel in Baghdad that housed journalists bombarded by a U.S. tank, killing three reporters. <coughs> Palestine in April 2003, a town in Texas outside which an oil tank mysteriously exploded. Palestine in April 2003, a town in West Virginia, home of PFC Jessica Lynch, the rescued wounded soldier. Except she wasn't rescued. There were no guns, no guards, no danger. The hospital put her in the cleanest room with the best bed, the one least likely to give bed sores, the Iraqi doctor explained. Then they notified the US Army so soldiers could come get her. And finally, Palestine in April 2003. A would-be nation, nothing new. Only the time of year when Jews are bound to tell the story of our liberation and thus, like it or not, our story is bound to the story of the people our people oppress. And when at the end of our Seder we say, next year in Jerusalem, hadn't we better smash open our hearts to lodge the frightened truth that Jerusalem is also theirs, that peace and home are also their birthright, that those who called it a land without people for a people without land were simply wrong. Melanie K. Kantrowitz. Presente. So I'm going to do my best to take this slow and tell a story I haven't told before in honor of my sister Melanie. My name is Yavila McCoy, and Melanie was my friend. She was my colleague. She was my comrade in arms. 
I met Melanie when she was writing The Colors of Jews. And at that time, I was a young activist. I was new in my body. I didn't yet know what it meant to be unapologetic as a black Jewish woman. But I was discovering what that meant. And so when she called me up and said, hey, you don't know me, but I'd like to go out with you for coffee. And I looked her up. <laughs> OK. So we went out for coffee. And she says, you know, I'm writing this thing, The Colors of Jews, and I'd love for you to partner and collaborate with me on this. And what I said to her was, um, before we go any further, I've been interviewed a number of times, and I just want to be clear with you. I am not going to help anyone to objectify my people. I do not want people to objectify black Jews as if they dropped off from Mars yesterday. We have been and have always been a part of the Jewish community. And if whatever you're going to do is not going to make it clear that we are present and in the past and part of the Jewish future, I'm probably not the person you want to interview. And she goes, wow. <laughs> Say more. Now I'm telling you this because that was the beginning of our relationship. Not just the beginning of our collaboration. Our relationship because for all the time I knew Melanie K. Kantrowitz, she always emphasized to me what Adrian Rich taught, which was that lying is done with words but also with silence. She wasn't willing to be silent about the empty spaces in our common Jewish legacy, heritage, and present that was not yet naming that Jews are black people, and that it was up to me and her together to create space for us to name that thing, and that she was not planning on going anywhere until we both felt that we were doing that job splendidly together. She also said to me that when a woman tells the truth, she is creating the possibility for more truth around her. At the time that I met Melanie, those words that she spoke in the colors of water had not yet been spoken. The intersectionality was not yet a Jewish concept. She was the one that said, as Jews, we are called by our history and heritage to be more. It was Melanie who said that Jewish identity is simultaneously a rock forged under centuries of pressure and water that is infinitely flexible. Flexible enough to hold her as a white Ashkenazi woman and flexible enough to hold me as a black Jewish woman. She was the one who said that Jews are intersectional by her body. She did it by the way she walked through the world. When we were working on The Colors of Jews, she didn't stay in New York. At the time, I was living in St. Louis. She says, ah, oh, I'll come to you. She flew out to St. Louis, Missouri to be a part of my first conference on Jewish diversity. And she spoke aggressively about the ways in which Jews must not just face racism outside of our community, but racism within our community. The notions within our community that have taught us that all we are is white, that all we are is Europe, that all, the whole section of the world that is not Europe and Poland and Germany does not our history as Jews. She helped me to welcome Jerba and Africa and Ethiopia and Yemen and Iraq and Iran and all the places that my people have always lived into my voice and into my body and into the splendid nature of what we mean when we say Jew. Now, she didn't just welcome us into Africa and the Middle East. She welcomed us into Europe, too. Volzer geschreien shalom, she said, yeah? I grew up in a Hasidic community in Brooklyn. I went to a school where me and my sister were the only people with this much melanin in our skin running around those halls. And in those spaces, they spoke Yiddish. And I was taught that Yiddish was the legacy of those white Jews, not my legacy. Yet Melanie sat with me at a table in the JCC and made me sing her the Negro spirituals of my family. And together we sang in a little shtetl gleich. And I could hear my grandmother in a little shtetl gleich. And she could hear me and my spirit in Volzir Gishrei and Shola. That is intersectionality, to do it with your body. And she did it by placing her body proximate to my own. 
And what I have to say about this woman is that I found peace in her laugh. I found peace in her wit, in her wry sense of humor, in the way in which she welcomed both our history and our future with love. She was the first one to apologize to me for the fact that during the Civil Rights Movement, we were very eager to go out and show up in the name of justice. But were we eager to go out and show up in the name of justice as Jews to the point where racism and white supremacy would no longer have a place? From those days, we marched forward amongst us. She apologized for every place I found where there was not enough oxygen for me and mine to breathe. And she didn't say it was the work outside of us. She said it was the work in here. And I could see it in her eyes. I could see it in her moral courage. I could see it in the sensitivity with which she would sit with me and offer me a cup of her warm, simmering fire. Melanie insisted on contending with contradictions. She was a woman who did not run from conflict. She was a woman who opened the world with her heart. She was a woman who spoke wisdom. She was a woman who personified for me that as a Jew, when we enter these days of awe that we are in right now, and when we say in our tradition, those words in our tradition from the Mishnah mean, open for me an opening that's only the size of an eye of a needle. And I will open for you an arch, the size that's opening of palaces. She opened those openings every single day with her heart, with her words, with her smile. It didn't matter whether there was a grand parade. With one word, with one smile, she sewed and stitched a space for us to be. I want to say today that my friend Melody was fierce. I want to say that she was a light before me and that she helped me to hold myself and to hold my own. I want to say, Melanie, I hope that we remain worthy. Melanie, I hope that we honor your life. Melanie, I hope we all have the same kishkas and guts that you so brilliantly placed before us. I hope that we are inspired to walk like you. I hope we are inspired by your humility. I hope that we take this path that you have shown us and decide to follow. I want to say that I take seriously what you said at the end of your essay. I am talking ultimately about our need for massive transformation of society. The old activists of my childhood who were my models, now I become them. May I become you, Melanie. May I be granted the strength and the fortitude to never run, but to always move forward. May you rest in power, my sister. May you always know that love made love. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. The sun may be there and then it's gone and it may not come again. Dusty road. On a hillside over there Well done Dry, open, and bare There and back again Oh, there But I can catch 
the ocean's morning tide. Early riser, where would I be without your song? Though you be hurting me, I'd rather you hear than gone. I need to, before I, I have a few things to say. <laughs> Let me just be clear about that. But um, before I do uh, get into the heart of that, I just want to take a moment to say Florence, her, her caned Florence, uh, and think about what people, again, are living through. Um, and in that moment of thinking about what's going on today, to think about what happened a year ago. And in, well, throughout the Caribbean, but particularly in Puerto Rico. And, you know, uh, Trump, what can I say? <laughs> um, but we cannot forget the people of Puerto Rico and the struggle that continues now, a year later, to reclaim their lives. So I encourage you all, those of you in New York, to join us on Thursday at a rally. <laughs> <laughs> and we have leaflets here. There's a stack in the back. Be sure to take them, because this work is important. And Rest assured, Melanie would have been there. So, 
Oh, it's at six o'clock at Union Square, everybody's favorite place to gather. <laughs> Thursday, but most importantly, take the leaflets, tell people, be there. Okay, that's the organizer in me. <laughs> uh, in the spring of 1997, my dear, dear friend, Vicki Gabriner, called to ask if I knew Melanie K. Kantrowitz. I had read some of her stuff, and I knew a little bit about her work with Jay Fridge, and maybe we even met at some point, but we didn't really know one another. Vicki said, Melanie is terrific and single. You're terrific and single. Can I give her your phone number? Because I think you'd be perfect together. I said, sure, and the rest, as they say, is history. She had it 100% right, and for that I say thank you, thank you, thank you, Vicki. <clears throat> there are other people I need to thank today. First, Hector Figueroa, Lenore Friedlander, Puella uh, Alvarez, and Nelson Rosero, and all the folks here at 32VJ whose assistance was invaluable. Second, thank you. <clears throat> Second, to the team who helped put this memorial together and the people who were up here before me who offered these incredibly moving tributes to Melanie. All of their names are in the program, so I'm not going to say them now. There are two other groups of people I need to thank. The first is Melanie's team of health professionals and caregivers. I start with Alessandro DeRocco, Melanie's neurologist and all around Mitch. To the other doctors, social workers, researchers, and administrative folks that worked with him, I say a big, big thank you. And the people, more specifically the women, who cared for Melanie at home. Uh, Jasminda Paz Evans, the incredible gem of a visiting nurse, and our aides, Sidoni Iwane, and the anchor of Melanie's home care, Christine Akali. Another major thank you. I have, I have tremendous respect for all these people, but want to call special attention to the aides. We place our loved ones in the hands of people we never met before, people willing and able to give care to a stranger. And both Christine and Sidonie have very strong and yet completely gentle and loving hands. I cannot find the words to say how thankful I am that they gave so much care and comfort to Melanie. <clears throat> the second group is what I call Team Leslie. The people who helped Melanie by helping me in so many ways. First, my family. I mean, okay, you're all my family. But my family family, you know what I mean. My sister, Karen. My brother and sister-in-law, Steve and Beth. Shauna and David. Joanna and Graham. Ray and Stefania. And all of their children. Even when far away, always in my corner, always full of love. My book group, which is as much about our friendship as it is about the books. <laughs> to um, a big thank you to Barbara Buloff, my therapist. Need I say more? <laughs> <laughs> to Mar Marla Erline, who for the last several years has been there for me in every way imaginable, never hesitating and always coming through. To Karen Zellmeyer, Tammy Gold, and Harriet Cohen, each of which gave me the support I needed when I needed it the most. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Much has already been said about Melanie, her work, the impact she had, who she was. And yet there is more to say, more than I really have time for today. 
I urge you, though, to read the postings on the website, the remembrances, the obits, and particularly the piece from Literary Lambda and the one from Manda Weiss. Check those out. Um, okay, this is hard, but as I said, I have a few things to say, so please bear with me. Melly and I shared our lives for 21 years, and how I wish that it could have been so much longer. The first months of our relationship were filled with telling our stories, soaking up everything we could about one another, not caring if we repeated the stories. We were already at an age when we sometimes forgot what we had previously <laughs> said, or didn't always remember what we had heard. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't matter. <laughs> None of that mattered. We were falling deeply in love. And just the sound of one another's voice gave us each great joy. We talked and talked and talked, and then we danced. She asked me what my favorite fruit was, and I said peach. Hers was nectarine. We both said close enough. <laughs> We talked about politics, the movies, families, our fears and dreams. Nothing was off limits, everything had meaning. We sat and listened to music, and then we danced. We imagined a long life together. Then one day, we sat at the doctor's office and heard the diagnosis, Parkinson's disease. We went to our new apartment, sat on the bed, held each other close and cried. Truth is, we had no idea what we were crying about. We didn't have a clue about how this disease would play out or what it would mean for our lives. But for many years after the diagnosis, our lives went on as they had. Our love grew, our connection deepened, and our commitment became stronger. And through all those years, we talked and talked and talked, and then we would dance. As she increasingly lost her ability to speak, we continued to find the ways to talk, if only for brief moments, but the dancing stopped. Melanie and I were best friends, lovers, and playmates. Last week, I woke up one morning and realized that she wouldn't be here to help me figure out what to wear today. <laughs> she had a much more finely tuned fashion sense than I do. Okay, just about everyone is better at that than I am. <laughs> it may sound small, but I cannot tell you how much I appreciated that she never insisted, never even suggested, that I wear anything that wasn't me. She knew me, she got me, she loved me fully as I am. Melanie was as interested in my ideas as I was in hers. She pushed me intellectually and politically, but always with great care and compassion. She was also my best editor. Right from the beginning, I knew Melanie was one of the smartest people I'd ever met. But she never bragged about her intellectual capacity, her analytic skills, her ability to find the core truth in things big and small. She always wanted to know more, to read what other people were writing, to push herself to see and try to understand the world through the eyes of others. Empathy and solidarity were not just words for her, they were a way of life. I also knew that her work had an impact on countless people, but it wasn't until after she died that I really took in the breath of that impact. People who read her books and had their minds blown. Those who heard her read her poetry and found new depth in their own feelings. The people whose masters or doctoral committee she sat on. The many, many people she organized with. And the countless people she helped in different ways just because that was who she was. Much of Melanie's work was grounded in her own very personal understanding of violence. She knew its destructive power, 
whether it was a child beaten by a parent, young people shot down in a school, a woman abused by a lover, people of color brutalized by racism and murdered by the police, whole nations terrorized by US military action, or decades of Palestinians killed and tortured and degraded by the horrors of Israeli apartheid and occupation. For Melanie, there was no hierarchy of oppression or pecking order of those on the receiving end of violence used to enforce power and control. <clears throat> she was also deeply grounded in the belief that everyone had the most basic right to control their own body and to defend themselves, their communities, their people against violence. She understood the realities of power and the need to be honest in one's assessment of the appropriate tools to use to challenge oppressive power. She was never into suicide missions or martyrdom. She would knock on doors in electoral campaigns or risk arrests in acts of civil disobedience. Whatever might work to try to challenge authority and shift power relations. It was always grounded in finding the larger community's power and asserting life. Soon after Melanie and I first got together, I told my mother, Jessie, that we were, quote, seeing each other. My mother asked if I was happy, which I was, and then in her own very special way, she said, isn't she very Jewish? <laughs> Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed, Melanie was very Jewish. <laughs> While never religious, she always looked for ways to put what she understood as core Jewish values into practice. Melanie proudly claimed her Jewish identity, just that she had earlier, that she had earlier taken on the identities of feminist and lesbian. Her first organizing experiences were in the civil rights movement, and then the anti-war movement of the 1960s. As her politics grew, she didn't leave behind her anti-racism or her anti-capitalism foundations. She flourished in the challenge to live a life that brought the pieces together, that pushed the envelope, that raised questions about all the structures of power. Her mind was always at work and she energetically gave her creative, intellectual, and organizing skills to the greater good, to the movement, to the community. Everything about Melanie's life, her very being, was grounded in the deepest empathy and the strongest commitment to solidarity I have ever seen. In 1978, in her first book, We Speak in Code, she wrote, quote, we all have stories they should be told. One part of my work is to create space for women to read and hear each other's work. This is not a matter of generosity or even of sharing privilege. I think the wildest creativity happens when many are engaged. By connecting with women whose experiences have not been voiced or voiced rarely, we expand who we are not only enlarging our private understandings of women's experience, but enlarging, enlarging the community of women makers so that our experience is more fully, more accurately named, explored, and known, and changed. I define my work, she said, as helping to create a climate of female outrageousness. So if I am a lesbian feminist artist, I am at least equally an activist happiest when I can be both at once. Her empathy played out in the most daily realities of her life. Several months after our first homemade started working with us, something came up that I wanted to be at on a day that the aide was not working, a Saturday. I started to ask Sonia, our aide, if she could work for a few hours that day when Melanie pulled me aside and emphatically said, don't do that. Don't ask her to work. I asked, why not? And Melanie said she has a kid and might need to spend some time with him. 
or maybe she needs to go shopping, whatever, it's her weekend, and we should not ask her to work. Standing here in the Union Hall, she was absolutely right. <laughs> in May of 20, 2001, at the Jewish Unity for a Just Peace, or Junity Conference in Chicago, Melanie proposed what she believed could be a powerful direct action, renouncing the Jewish, quote, right to Israeli citizenship granted by Israel's law of return. People, she later recalled, were unnerved by the, by the proposal and responded strongly. But that was fine, for after all, she was always raising the big questions and posing the hard challenges. She elaborated the idea in an essay in Wrestling with Zion, a book edited by Tony Kushner and Alyssa Solomon. And in that, she recalled thinking back to the hundreds of Vietnam vets who had hurled their combat medals onto the steps of the Capitol, trying to imagine a gesture that would, quote, communicate our rage at the Israeli government's violation of human rights, our grief at the protracted suffering, and our sense of betrayal by those cynics who invoke Jewish survival, our survival, to justify brutality. Her essay ends with her imagining what she would say if, were she to show up at the Israeli consulate to reject her right to Aliyah. She said, quote, I do not believe the solution to anti-Semitism is the creation of another hated minority so that I can enjoy the privileges of majority. Far from feeling protected by Israel, I feel exposed to danger by the actions of the Israeli state. I identify with those people who cherish life and believe that each of us is worth exactly the same. I am declaring another way to be Jewish. In the, in the Colors of Jews, the many-layered book that several people referred to already, Melanie took a bold, powerful step and offered an alternative to Zionism. She wrote, Diasporism offers a place we might join with others who value a history of dispersion, others who stand in opposition to nationalism and the nation state, who choose instead to value border crossing. I name this ideology and practice diasporism as a deliberate counter to Zionism. This is no casual invitation to perpetually wander. The diasporism I have in mind recognizes the persecution and danger that have made many long for home and passport, yearn to leave the wandering behind. Inside this longing, Diasporism represents tension, resistance to both assimilation and nostalgia, to both corporate globalization that destroys peoples and cultures, and to nationalism, which promises to preserve people and cultures, but so often distorts them through the prisons of masculinism, racism, and militarism. The political version of love is solidarity. Diasporus values solidarity not as a necessary, e necessary evil, not solely because as we confront the most powerful machines of war and capital the world has ever known, we understand that solidarity is, is our only power. Diasporus choose solidarity as the highest expression of humanity. It's about, for example, Rachel Corey placing her body, her life, against a caterpillar bulldozing one more Palestinian home. Diasporism cherishes love across the borders. And let's face it, every reaching out beyond one's own body is a border crossing. <clears throat> As I, I just, I'm almost done. <laughs> Um, as I said in the message I sent out when she died, for many years, Melanie fought as hard as she could against Parkinson's disease. But this was one battle she could not win. It was a long and often very difficult journey. And the last few years were particularly hard 
as the disease claimed her mind. That brilliant mind that could always make sense of the most complex and challenging realities and her amazing ability to use language in ways few could all, few could, all slipped away. And still she fought to control her own body, to determine her own destiny. While I miss her terribly, uh, I am filled with joy knowing how many people she touched. As a friend, co-worker, teacher, writer, an incredible writer, as a sister and comrade and co-conspirator in the struggles for justice and peace. Melanie's presence was often, strong, often soft, but always, always strong. Her moral compass was always set in the right direction, and she always had the courage to speak out, to take action, and to bring others along with her. <clears throat> they say you died twice. Once when you stop breathing, and a second time when somebody says your name for the last time. I believe Melanie's name will be said over the years as new generations of activists and thinkers and compassionate people step up to play a role in changing this world. Melanie K. Kantrowitz, presente, presente, presente.